Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Is everybody warm? I'm getting some dirty looks. I checked before I stood up. It is 17 degrees outside. It's 60 degrees in here. Is the furnace doing something? Is it sufficient? Would you like to be warmer? So in a sense, we're kind of lukewarm this morning, right? <laughs> you see what I did there? Because we're in the church at Laodicea, the lukewarm church. We're in part two of that message. And we're going to do a quick review of the first part that we covered last time. We're, we're really ending the seven churches right where we started in the sense that the first church, Ephesus, connected to Laodicea, they have the same problem. The first church lost its first love. Was it aware that it lost its first love? No. In the same way, as we find the counsel to Laodicea, we as a people seem to be unaware of our true condition. Now, we said, historically speaking, you know, when you're thinking of the timeline, Laodicea really had its beginning in 1844, and we're, we're still in Laodicea today. Now, it was a literal place. We looked at that last time. We looked at the city of Laodicea. We looked at the fact that it was wealthy, that it had an extensive banking system. It made ISAV. It had a medical facility. All the attributes that Jesus talked about literally happened or were part of that city. They were proud and self-sufficient. Remember, there was an earthquake that destroyed the city, and they built it with their own money. They rebuilt. They refused imperial help. And so Jesus comes to them, and he says, you know not your true condition. They're wealthy, but he is saying to them, you need my wealth. You need to buy from me gold. Their eye institute was totally insufficient. Jesus said to them, I have eye salve that you need. And they were well known for their black apparel. They wore it as a status symbol. And Jesus says, that's not what you need, right? You need my white raiment. And so that was from a historical perspective, but we found that the personal application is really where it's going to hit home for us. We looked at the fact that the angel of the church of Laodiceans was told to write these things, says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And we said Laodicea, the actual word means a judging of the people. This fit perfectly into the fact that we're living in the anti-typical day of judgment. Yeah. And so we stand in the judgment with Christ. And he is a faithful witness. Amen. We need a faithful witness. One who is the creator of all things. And we said beyond that, the beautiful picture that's being painted here is that we have a judge and an advocate who knows our weaknesses. He was tested in all points as we are. He is able to sympathize with you and I. And I just find that to be so comforting, don't you? Now, the other thing we saw as we looked at the seven churches that Jesus had good and bad things to say about every church up to this point. Some, some churches had, he had nothing bad to say, but this is the first church where he has nothing good to say. Everything that is said in his counsel to Laodicea is the fact that they are found wanting. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. And we said last time, no, we are not saved by our works. Amen. Amen. But we are judged by those works, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And the judgment is about revealing how much surrender you have because the works that are being judged should be his works, shouldn't they? Mm -hmm. And if we're totally surrendered, it would be his life being lived out from within <laughs> and the works would be acceptable. Jesus says, you're neither cold nor hot. There's works happening, but they're not good enough to survive the judgment, right? Kind of like Belshazzar in that feast back there in Daniel. When the writing was on the wall, we, like him, are hearing the words, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. The good news this morning is that for him, probation was closed. For us, it is not. Amen? Amen. There is still time to change the condition and we praise him for that because we know that in revelation 22 he says behold i am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work and that reward will only 
come to those whose works are his works. Amen? We also said that as we look at this message, we have constantly, we've got to come back to the fact that Jesus does not utter a word of rebuke that is not bathed in love. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The words that he speaks to us are not to tear us down, to make us in a state of despair, but rather to lift us up. So he says, so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, we said lukewarm is terrible because lukewarm doesn't really know their condition, right? If they were cold, they would have a need for Christ. If they were hot, they're living for Christ. But when you're in the middle, it's as if you believe that you're living for Christ when you're really not. Jesus says, I can't, I can't live with that condition. I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. We're no longer going to be in the mouth of Christ, no longer part of him, if this condition does not change. Now, the vomiting out of the mouth, we also likened last time to the fact that there is a shaking that must take place before Jesus returns. Now, the, the concept of the shaking is really brought out here in Hebrews 12. It says here, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from where? From heaven. Whose voice then, when he was on the earth, shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. We want to remain, don't we? We want to be in a place where we cannot be shaken. In order to do that, we must be firmly planted on Christ. Ephesians 5.27, the necessary shaking that's taking place is because God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle, right? or any such thing, but she should be holy and without blemish. The wedding is taking place when, friends? In heaven, that's where, but when is the wedding taking place? Yeah, before he comes. Before he comes. We studied before. I was hoping you could answer. When is the wedding taking place? Right now. That's right. The wedding is happening now. Remember, Jesus returns from the wedding, right? It's taking place right now since 1844. Is the bride ready for the wedding? No. Revelation 19, 7 and 8, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. Here's the good news. The, the bride will be ready. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of who? The saints. Righteous acts of the saints. May I submit to you that those righteous acts are actually Jesus' acts? Would you agree with that this morning? Yeah. Lived out in the lives of his people. That's what makes the wife ready. Last day events, page 175, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this message or this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. You see, some, even today, are probably listening to these words and applying them to other people, not recognizing that they apply to each one of us. Amen? Jesus is telling us our true condition. Will we believe it this morning? We must see ourselves as God sees us. Isn't that right? Isaiah, when he came face to face with God, Scripture records, so I said, woe is me, for I am what? I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Job, even though nothing is recorded that Job did anything wrong, by the end of Job, when he sees God, notice what he says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I what? I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. 
Every character of Scripture, when they come face to face with God, recognizes that they are in a desperate position. Simon Peter, in the boat, saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter recognized his true position before Christ. It brought him to a place of absolute humility. Desire of Ages, we just looked at this Thursday. The proud heart strives to earn salvation, but both our title to heaven, which would be justification, and our fitness for it, which would be sanctification, are found in the righteousness of who? Christ. The Lord can do how much? Nothing toward the recovery of man until, convinced of his own weakness and stripped of all self-sufficiency, he yields himself to the control of God. Can you agree with that this morning? This is where we have all started in our Christian walk, hopefully. We were at a place where we recognized we were sinners separated from God. Our only hope, our only place of refuge was at the feet of him. Amen? But some, somehow along the walk, whether in a flurry of activity or in some kind of state of inactivity and a false sense of security, we have lost our dependency upon Jesus for everything. This is brought out in the Beatitudes. We just, again, we studied this Thursday night. It's so fresh on my mind. The first step, blessed are the poor in spirit. You cannot get to the other steps until you are poor in spirit, until you recognize your utter need of Christ. Isn't that true? How are you going to be humble? How are you going to mourn over sin if you don't first recognize that you're a sinner? How are you going to show mercy or develop a pure heart? The final step there is that we suffer persecution for his name. Let me ask you, how well are we suffering persecution today? Does not self rise up at the slightest annoyance? Does not the silver tongue glare with a blaze of fire on the way home as we talk about what so-and-so said and what so-and-so did? How are we suffering for Christ now? Does the evidence weigh out that we have experienced step one and we're moving up through the Beatitudes? Or is something wrong? See, this message was brought to the church through Jones and Wagner. How many have heard the, the names Jones and Wagner? 1888, General Conference. We're told through the writings of Sister White that the Lord could have come well nigh this if only the church would have risen to this message and accepted it. It was a message of righteousness by faith, faith in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Now, there is a lie that's being taught out there that we have since accepted that message and we now understand it. Let me submit to you, we are still here today because we have failed to assimilate this message into our lives. Amen. Testimonies to ministers, page 91. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in what? Obedience to all the commandments of God. Let me ask you this morning, are we obedient to all the commandments of God? Isn't it safe, therefore, to, to ask the same question, have we truly received the righteousness of Christ? Amen? Mm -hmm. Many had lost sight of Jesus. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. That's the latter rain. Amen? And with it will come great persecution. How could we as a people suffer great persecution, the last step in the Beatitudes, if we haven't gotten past the first one? We're not ready. Doesn't the Bible tell us, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution? A will, shall. It's a definite article, right? 
Great controversy, page 48. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason, the only reason, is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Wow. So how, how is it that we're going to get from where we are to where we need to be? Do we take the top path, the children of Israel, and wander and go this way and that? Who wants to take the top path? Or do we take the bottom path? A straight line from A to B, where we are to where Jesus wants us to be. Who wants to take the bottom path this morning? <laughs> Amen. Thankfully, it is so clear and so concise that we don't have to wonder. Amen. Jesus says in 318, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. I like the fact that he counsels us, don't you? That word already signifies that Jesus is one that wants to minister to us. He wants to sit down and reason together. Yes? Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. I always kind of like the paintings of Harry Anderson. Anybody else like his paintings? I just... I don't know. They move me in a certain way. This one's called the divine counselor. And you see, there's a reasoning there together. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter one and verse 18. Come now, the Lord says, and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's our condition this morning, isn't it? He wants to reason with us. He wants to counsel with us. And he asks us, to buy from him gold refined in the fire. Everything that he's going to ask us to buy, by the way, he already owns. Isn't that true? He is the storehouse that we go to, and the products that we need are already in his possession. He has them. He's willing to bestow them to us. How do we buy something when we've already been told we're poor? Isaiah 55 and verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. I like the way that Bunch in his commentary on Revelation said it. Christ virtually says to the Laodiceans, thou hast nothing to give, but thou must give all that thou hast. Amen? Amen. <laughs> The price is one that even the beggar can pay. It places all on equality as far as spiritual riches are concerned. The price is penitence, confession, and self-surrender. The gifts of God can be purchased only at the cost of moral endeavor. Humble repentance and courageous faith. All the truth and wisdom and understanding we have acquired have cost us something in time and effort, if not in actual money. The person who is not willing to sacrifice and endure to attain the heavenly treasure must remain without it, for it will be given to no one without a price. And the price can be paid by everyone here. Amen. Make some effort, we're told. These precious treasures will not drop upon us without some exertion on our part. We must buy, be zealous, and do what? Repent. This is the price, brothers and sisters. Of our lukewarm state, we must be awake to see our wrongs, to search for our sins, and to zealously repent of them. This is what the disciples paid in the upper room, isn't it? When they spent multiple days together confessing their sins one to another, humbly asking God to reveal to them where it is that they were being selfish, where they were being separated from the leading of his spirit. This is the price to repent and confess one to another. 
Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. You know, when you refine gold or any precious metal, you, you melt it. And those impurities rise to the top and they sort of skim those off the top so that you have the pure substance. This gold in scripture is likened to our faith. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuous, genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're told in Second Testimonies, the gold mentioned by Christ, the true witness, which all must have, has been shown me to be faith and what? Love combined. And love takes the precedence of faith. Satan is constantly at work to remove these precious gifts from the hearts of God's people. All are engaged in playing the game of life. Satan is well aware that if he can remove love and faith and supply their place with selfishness and unbelief, all the remaining precious traits will soon be skillfully removed by his deceitful hand and the game will be lost. Christ Object Lessons tells us the gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. There it is again. Only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active. We may do much work. But without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. Who here has that love? Of ourselves? Do you think we have it? No. It must be given. It must be bestowed upon us. It must be a gift that Christ gives because you and I, just as we cannot obey apart from him, we cannot love apart from him. Amen? Great Controversy 621. The assaults of Satan are fierce and determined. His delusions are terrible, but the Lord's eye is upon his people. And his ear listens to their cries. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them. But the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. I'm sure we've all heard the quote that every earthly support will be what? Cut off. You know where that's going to bring us to? Either a place where we deny him or a place that we recognize that our daily bread is dependent upon him. Amen. Jesus said, I counsel to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. This is echoed, by the way, in Revelation 16 and verse 15. The context here is the, is the final plagues. The timing is right before the dragon and the beast and the false prophet finish their gathering for that great day before the Lord. And Jesus once again reminds his people, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. We need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You know, it's interesting, you do a search on Christ's righteousness as far as artwork goes, and I have yet to find an accurate portrayal of what the covering of Christ's righteousness looks like. Why do I say that? Because in every picture, there's a problem here. Do you see what the problem is? Yeah, the robe of righteousness is being placed over top of the filthy garments. Is there a problem with that? Yeah, Zechariah 3 and verse 4, where this imagery is taken from, as Zechariah envisions, sees the judgment scene. He sees a covering being placed over the priest. It says, take away the filthy garments from him. They must first be removed. That's the act of confession, right? And to him, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Can the robe of righteousness go over top of sin, known sin in our lives? Never. Christ Object Lessons, page 311. 
Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. I counsel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. This robe this is a famous quote. I'm sure many know it. This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled, what? By sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. He said of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. When on earth, he said to his disciples, I have kept my Father's commandments. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Amen? Amen. Are we living his life this morning? You know, I think it's interesting. I looked back at some of the general conferences since 1888 when the message was rejected. And there was one in 1893 where, where the spirit of prophecy says that the, the showers of blessing fell. And I just want to share with you a few words of A.T. Jones as he talked during that general conference. This is what he said in his sermon that was recorded. Speaking on Laodicea, he says, the first thing he, Christ, says is, I know thy works. And the last, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Are you ready to repent of your works now? Are you? Are you ready to admit that your works that you have done are not as good as Jesus Christ would have done them if he had been here himself and done them instead of you? That's a pointed question, isn't it? In everything we've done, have we not messed it up in some capacity? I mean, every evangelistic effort, every ministry outreach, every interaction we've ever had, have we not in some capacity just made a mess of it? Now, I'm not saying God is not blessed. He blesses us in spite of us, doesn't he? But if he were here doing it instead of you, would not it have been perfect, infinitely better? Someone from the audience said, yes, a thousand times. Good. A.T. Jones said, how much good are these works going to do you? Are they perfect? Are they righteous works? Do not forget that the garment that we are to buy, that garment woven in the loom of heaven and not one thread of human invention in it, then if you and I stuck up a single thread of our invention in that life that we have professed to be living in Christ, we have spoiled the garment? Brethren, do you suppose you and I have gone on these 15 or 20 years so absolutely perfect that we have never got a thread of human invention into our character by our deeds? The congregation says no. A.T. Jones asked the question, then we can repent of that, can't we? And they said yes. Yes. What is our condition? You know well enough that our efforts at that have not accomplished much. Everyone has tried to do his very best. You know yourself that it was the most discouraging thing that you ever tried to do in this world. You know yourself that you have actually sat down and cried because you could not dwell or to, could not do well enough to risk the judgment. A voice from the crowd says, could not do well enough to satisfy ourselves. 
No, A.T. Jones says, we ourselves were able to see our nakedness when we had tried our best to cover ourselves. You know that it is so. Now, brethren, the Lord said so, didn't he? The congregation said, yes, sir. Is it not time that we said, Lord, that it is so? Now, the Lord wants us to be covered. He wants us to be covered so that the shame of our nakedness shall not appear. He wants us to have his perfect righteousness according to his own perfect idea of righteousness. He wants us to have that character that will stand the test of the judgment without a hitch or a question or a doubt. Let us accept it from him as the free blessed gift it is. Can you say amen to that? You know, I think it's fitting that when you look at the Day of Atonement, we're in the anti-typical Day of Atonement, but when you look at the actual Day of Atonement recorded there, the earthly one, Leviticus 23, it says, and you shall do how much? No work on that same day, for it is the Day of Atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. You know, there's this concept in Scripture about doing no work, even in the Sabbath commandment. You remember when we said it together? How much work are we to do on the Sabbath? No work. The Sabbath is a small picture of the sanctifying work that God is doing in our lives. And how much credit are you and I going to get for that? Zero. It's his work. There's this concept in scripture that something supernatural needs to happen in you and I. Everyone that will be in the kingdom, there must be a work that's done that's without hands. Job 34 in verse 20, in a moment they die, talking about the wicked. In the middle of the night, the people are shaken and pass away. The mighty are taken away without a hand. It implies it's supernatural. This wasn't done by a human army. What took place there? That was supernatural. In the same way, Daniel 2, we know this prophecy well. You watched while a stone was cut out. How? Without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. What is that implying? Was that stone cut out by men? Did it come by men? It was done without hands. It implies that this was something that was God's work and not man. Say amen. Colossians 2, verses 9 through 11. For in him, in God, or Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made how? Without hands, by putting off the body of sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of who? Christ. This supernatural work that must take place in every one of us has to be done without hands. It's his work, not our works. Amen. You see, within Adventism, we without hesitation, agree with the statement that justification is God's work. We come to him just as we are. But I think that the enemy has been very successful into sliding in there to believe that in some capacity, sanctification is both his work and our work. Not so. Sanctification is also completely, utterly, completely his work. There is a work for us to do, but it is only in submitting. Amen. And that's a full-time job. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, Hey, easy peasy, one, two, three, easy, right? <laughs> what I'm saying is that our work is not the sanctification. It is staying connected so that his work of sanctification will come to its completion. Philippians 3 and verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have how much confidence in the hands? No confidence. It's God's work, not ours. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his what? Workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's his work. We are his workmanship. You ever build something that was like super delicate, a model or a puzzle, or you have something in a house that's expensive and it's really delicate and there's a little child around and you leave the room and you say, what do you say? Don't touch, right? And you have little confidence because you leave the room and then you come, you're not touching that, are you? 
right? That's how God is with us. Hands off, brothers and sisters. This is my work, amen? amen. He does it completely. Ephesians 5, 26, 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for that he and I, that we might know that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Who's doing the work? Jesus is doing the work. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you how much? Completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen. Amen. This is God's work. Hebrews 13, verse 12, therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Remember what we read together in Christ object, object Lessons? This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Amen? Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. Think of the imagery. Remember that holy ark being transferred and they put it on the ox cart? Remember the story? And Uzzah, you know, the one line or poor Uzzah, the one line he gets in scripture. He meant well, right? The ox cart stumbled the ark begins to tilt and totter that holy thing that was off limits. And Uzzah reached out with his what? With his hand to steady it, to help in what was happening. And he was struck dead on the spot, off limits. In the same way, this work that we're talking about of sanctification, justification, glorification, it's all Jesus or it's not going to happen. Amen? We have to come to that point in every one of our lives where we recognize nothing good of ourselves do we bring to the table ever, not ever, not on our best day. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Here's where we come in, James 4, 7. You want to do something? I want to do something. Here's where we come in. What do we do? James 4, 7, therefore submit. Is that a verb? Yeah. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You can see this in every miracle that Jesus performed. I'll just pick one here. Naaman. Naaman was told to go and wash in the river how many times? Did he want to go? Did he resist to go? Did he rationalize not to go? But eventually he went. He submitted to what was told him to do. He resisted the rationalization not to do it. And he drew near to God by going into the river. Did he heal himself? Could he take any credit for the healing that took place there? Who did the hard work? Christ did the hard work. Naaman simply submitted resisted and drew near and miraculous things happened. Amen. It's that way with victory over sin. It's that way with every miracle that ever happened. We get zero credit. There is no merit in the submitting, resisting, and drawing near. And God is glorified to the utmost. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Submitting is a full-time job, brothers and sisters. Steps to Christ, page 43, says the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. Do you ever feel that battle? The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requ requires a struggle, but the soul must what? Submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. That's our work. That's the only work that he's ever given us. But your hands, my hands have no part touching that holy thing, which is his work. Amen. 
Testimonies Volume 1, why is it so hard to lead a self-denying, humble life? Because professed Christians are not dead to the world. It is easy living after we are dead. But many are longing for the leeks and onions of Egypt. They have a disposition to dress and act as much like the world as possible and yet go to heaven. Such climb up some other way. They do not enter through the straight gate and the narrow way. Submission is about surrender. And it's about drawing near to God. And that is a step-by-step -step process, day by day, moment by moment. And when we do that, he will do his work. Amen? Amen. Romans 9, 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. You may look at yourself and say, well, I don't, you know, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. I don't have enough time. God can do a short work, amen, and will do to his glory. Last day events, page 219, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. So we're not shaken out. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. Without hands. Closing thought on without hands, Acts chapter 17, verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made how? With hands. You and I are a temple. I don't want that temple to be made with hands. Do you? I want him to dwell in that temple. Don't you? All right. All right, point number three from Revelation 3.18, there's one last thing, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You know, I'm actually pretty blind. I should be wearing glasses. I really should. Whenever I put them on at home, I feel like I have superpowers. It was like, wow, everything's so clear. I don't wear glasses because the more I wear them, I feel like my muscles, my eye muscles actually relax and it gets worse and worse. But I can understand how this eye salve and the ability to see clearly, that's what Jesus wants us to have. Now, how, do, how does God anoint biblically? It's always the same way. Acts 10, 38 is a perfect example. Now, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. The anointing, the eye salve, is the Holy Spirit. It's also how the Holy Spirit moved through men and wrote holy words, the very words we, we hold with us this morning. Review and Herald, we're told the eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Upon its correct view of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul and, and being depends. The eye salve, the word of God, makes the conscience smart under its application, for it convicts of sin, but the smarting is necessary that the healing may follow and the eye be single to the glory of God. Let's review as we begin to close. The remedy is found in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Everything that he's asked us to buy from him, he already possesses and is willing to give to each one of us. The gold tried in the fire, which is faith tested, this is the experience of Christ. His life was already tested. He already went through the fire of persecution. He already survived, and he would survive the judgment in your case, wouldn't he? We must possess that faith of Christ. Not faith in Christ. That's important. But we must have the faith of Christ, the faith that already had victory in every area that could possibly be won. Amen? Amen. Think about it this way. Revelation 14, 12. We know this scripture. Come on, we're Adventists, right? Here, this is the culmination of the three angels' messages. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And what? The faith in Jesus? The faith of Jesus. You see, if you read that correctly, we're actually keeping. Keeping means to possess, to do. We're keeping two things, aren't we? We're keeping the commandments of God, and we're keeping what else? The faith of Jesus, something that we've bought from him in this process of confession and repentance. And he says, now I can give you the gold that's already been tried in the fire. 
It will get you through every temptation, through every sin that you struggle with, through every battle you must fight. This will win every time. Amen. White garments, again, we must get them from him. There's nothing of ourselves that we can do to weave them. They've already been woven and offered to you. It is the life of Christ. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The eye salve, the word of God, empowered by the Spirit. Again, we need to buy from him. This is not something you can muster up. We need to see with new eyes, don't we? Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Testimonies, Volume 1, those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness. And they will receive the what? The latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. Who here wants the latter rain? Amen. Concept of the latter rain is brought out in James 5, 7, and 8. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I think, I think that uh, scripture is more relevant today than it has ever been. Turn with me in your Bibles as we look up one last text together. Joel, the book of Joel, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. Screen says verse 23. We're just going to look at verse 11 just to set the stage. Joel 22 or Joel chapter 2, verse 11. When you're there, say amen. amen. All right. The Bible reads, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? That, by the way, is the same text that's used in Revelation chapter 6, where the question is asked, the great day of the Lord has come, who shall be able to stand? The context is the soon coming of the Lord. Verse 12, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with how much of your heart? All your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. It's a work that must be done. It's a repentance. There's a revival that needs to take place. The promise is in verse 23 that I want you to look at. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, the former rain, does your Bible have cross-references or marginal statements? Do you see there beside the former rain, there's a little number? Mine has a little number seven there. I have to reference it in my cross-references. Do you see that in your Bibles? What does it say there for the cross-reference or the, the marginal reading for the former rain? Anybody have a marginal reading there? A teacher of righteousness. Now, does yours have a little cross-reference beside the word moderately? What does it say there? According to righteousness. This early rain is a teacher of righteousness that came to them according to righteousness. And that's what's coming in the latter rain. I wonder what that means. Next time, we're going to find out. <laughs> Next time, as we close out Laodicea, we are going to look at what could have been, what is, and what shall be. I hope that this has been a blessing to you this morning. Let's stand together.